Welcome to the Pretty Good Policy for Crypto podcast, where we have in-depth discussions on cryptocurrency policy and regulation. I'm Paul Brigner, and I'm head of U.S. policy and strategic advocacy for the Electric Coin Company. In a few moments, you will hear from my colleague and co-host, Gary Weinstein, head of global regulatory relations at Electric Coin Company, who will be joined by our guest, Peter Van Valkenburg, director of research at Coin Center. We believe in fostering a respectful and inclusive environment for our discussions. And while we at Electric Coin Company hold strong opinions on the need for private and confidential financial transactions in crypto to promote economic freedom, our guests may have differing views. Through these thought-provoking and at times challenging conversations, we aim to deepen our understanding of complex policy and regulatory issues and work towards the development of pretty good policy for the cryptocurrency world. This podcast is for educational purposes only and is not legal or financial advice. Our guests' remarks may not reflect the views of their organization or of Electric Coin Company. Thank you for tuning into the podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. It is with great excitement that we welcome our distinguished guest, Peter Van Valkenburg, the Director of Research at Coin Center. Boasting a diverse background in law, economics, and technology, Peter has dedicated his career to examining the interplay between policy and cryptocurrencies, with the goal of fostering a regulatory environment that encourages innovation and safeguards individual rights. Prior to his role at Coin Center, Peter was a Google Policy Fellow for Tech Freedom, contributing to policy and litigation briefs. He co-founded First Stage, the first professional theater company in Fairfax County, Virginia. Coin Center, based in Washington, D.C., is a premier nonprofit research and advocacy organization that addresses public policy issues concerning cryptocurrencies and decentralized technologies like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other groundbreaking blockchain innovations. Coin Center's mission is to champion the rights of individuals to create and utilize free and open cryptocurrency networks while upholding the rights to write and publish code, form peer to peer networks, and maintain privacy. To realize its objectives, Coin Center conducts and disseminates policy research, educates policymakers and the media about cryptocurrencies, advocates for well-informed public policy, and participates in litigation to protect digital civil liberties. By nurturing a regulatory atmosphere that supports innovation and personal freedoms, Coin Center plays a pivotal role in shaping the future of blockchain and cryptocurrency. Peter obtained a BS in economics from George Mason University and later earned a JD specializing in intellectual property from NYU School of Law. He has provided testimony before Congress, briefed legislators in the United States and European Union, and established a network of thought leaders, academics, and experts within the realm of cryptocurrency. In addition to his responsibilities at Coin Center, Peter is a board member at the Zcash Foundation. Peter's unique blend of legal expertise, technical acumen, and enthusiasm for blockchain and decentralized technologies has solidified his position as a leading voice in the ongoing conversation about cryptocurrency policy and its influence on innovation and individual liberties. Peter, it is a point of privilege for both me and Paul to have you on the PGB for Crypto podcast. Thank you for joining. Of course, you're too kind, Gary. I'm happy to be here. Let's dive in. So could you give us an overview of Coin Center and its mission I teased a little bit in the intro, but I think it'd be instructive to learn a little bit about what Coin Center is up to those days. And how did you become involved with Coin Center and what motivated you to focus on research and advocacy for cryptocurrencies and decentralized computing technologies? Yeah. So um, Coin Center has been around for actually a pretty long time in crypto years because we started in 2014. So gosh, we're almost a decade now um, doing the work that we do. And we, um, since the beginning, we've always said we do three things. We do education, and um, this is mostly what we focused on in our first few years, because especially in 2014, if you were a staffer on the Hill and your member was asking questions about cryptocurrency, you you couldn't call up Bitcoin to give them answers, you know. Um, You still can't to this day, but back then, there were certainly far more questions without sort of prejudgments, without any, you know, any early resources. And so the idea of Coin Center was you should be able to call Coin Center. And we're a nonprofit dedicated to representing the technology. 
So, you know, there will be companies in the space who will hopefully build profitable, successful businesses on top of the technology, but they can only speak of their, you know, company's interests. They can't speak for the network as a whole because the network is just like the internet. It's a public good. You know, it's an open permissionless system that allows people and businesses to build things. And so who speaks for that public good that is the network? Ideally, that'd be Coin Center. And, you know, we are, um, you know, lawyers by training uh, primarily and also, you know, sort of self-taught in the technology because we were enthusiasts or we were interested. And so, you know, we can often answer questions about how these things work, sort of hopefully uh, developed a, an expertise in explaining really complicated <laughs> software and um, computer science ideas to people who have more of a law background, both potentially very complex and difficult subjects, but often, you know, don't talk to each other. And, you know, if we can't explain something, we can al always find somebody in, in, in our networks who can hopefully explain it. So we can go find um, someone who's at Chainalysis to come talk about traceability on these systems. We can go find somebody at, say, Coinbase who can talk about, you know, building um, custodial exchanges on top of these technologies. And so that education component was sort of like the main thing we did, especially in those first few years, because there was such demand. Um, the second thing that we've done, or we've always, we've always uh, focused on, is uh, research. And this isn't so much research into the technology itself. We leave that to um, academics and to people building new projects, it's research into the policy questions. So um, when we're having these conversations with policymakers where they say like, okay, you, I, I see how Bitcoin works, but uh, is somebody who's uh, running a node on the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network a money transmitter? You know, in 2014, that was more of an unanswered question. Uh, and it's it's a hard question to answer, not because the technology uh, is, is hard to parse, but because the intersection of the technology with existing law, say money transmission law, which is different in any, every one of the 53 states and territories that has a money transmission statute, um, that intersection has, has been under-researched, especially in 2014. So that's where our policy research work came into play. I'm the director of research at Coin Center, so this was sort of like my specialty, is my specialty there. Can we come up with a paper that explains, um, like, here are uh, the money transmission statutes across the country. Um, you know, here's the activities that someone who's running a node on the Bitcoin network is performing. Do those activities, do those facts match that law? And in most cases, the answer was no. And we would also argue that to the extent the answer is maybe or yes, maybe, then we need to think about the policy implications of classifying someone who's just running peer-to-peer -peer software on a network as a financial institution, as a money transmitter. And that brings us to the third thing that we've always done um, and specialized in, which is advocacy. So, you know, we educate, we research policy, um, policy questions, and then we come up with solutions to these policy questions or answers to these policy questions that we think are both best for regulators and policymakers to help them meet their objectives, whether they're investor protection or consumer protection. But we'll also, and this is central to Coin Center's mission, preserve the freedom to innovate. So, you know, if we're researching the specific topic of how does running a node on the Bitcoin network intersect with money transmission licensing law, the answer that you can assume we're going to come up with is, you know, if what you're doing is non-custodial, if what you're doing is truly just facilitating a public good, a peer-to-peer -peer network that helps other people move their money, um, you're not putting consumers in a position of danger. You're, you don't have counterparty risk. You don't create counterparty risk. Um, you shouldn't have to license, right? Because licensing these folks would effectively kill the vibrancy of these peer-to-peer -peer networks and make the technology non-viable. And so that's an advocacy position. It's no longer sort of just facts. It's no longer just um, neutral legal analysis. It's something we want to fight for. And so Coin Center exists ultimately to do that education and, and that research and then fight for the outcomes we think are best on both sides um, to sort of reach a good policy compromise. And in fighting for those outcomes, anyone who has been watching this space for some time will immediately recognize you as one of a small group of people who regulators and policymakers go to when they want to understand the nuances and some of the uh, minutia and the technical, highly technical details of how blockchain technology works. You've testified before Congress uh, in the United States and also in the European Union, as I described in the intro. Um, 
I'm curious, however, as to what drew you to Coin Center and what motivates you to testify uh, before these important policymakers um, and meetings with regulators. Where do you see the intersection of your personal interests, the platform that Coin Center offers you, and then your ability to make a difference with this new disruptive technology? So I, I guess um, I guess I'd go back to uh, when I was at law school. I knew I wanted to focus on technology law and the intersection of public policy and the internet. I was sort of my my heroes and my heroes to this day are folks like John Perry Barlow, uh, songwriter for the Grateful Dead, but also founding board member of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, who famously wrote the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, which is uh, you know sort of a he's a fire he was a firebrand. Uh, sadly, passed away a few years ago. Um, so I was inspired by you know the crypto wars of the 1990s, which were you know policy debates, really significant policy debates about crypto as in cryptography rather than crypto as in cryptocurrency. Um, and I, I think when I was in law school, I thought like sort of I, I, I missed my timing. If I wanted to be involved in that, those things, a lot of those battles had been fought. Many of them won. You know, we, um, we ended up with the DMCA safe harbor as far as the, you know, preventing the overbroad application of copyright to intermediaries on the internet. We got the Communications Decency Act uh, safe harbor so that, you know, intermediaries are shielded from crushing um, li liability for defamation claims for user-generated content. And we avoided things like the Clipper chip, uh, which was an attempt to sort of bake in inherently broken encryption hardware into all computers sold in the U.S., which would have been, of course, a disaster, both from a personal privacy context, but also from a national security context as well, because, you know, we need to keep secrets and American citizens need to keep secrets uh, and the American government needs to keep secrets. So broken hardware is a bad idea. Anyway, I've gone off on a tangent, but you know, those were the things I was really passionate about. Um, and like I said, I thought maybe I was born a little bit uh, too late, um, um, but it turns out I was born at the right time. And I'm just very fortunate um, uh, to be able to be in, in a place where in 2014, I'm graduating from law school I'm working uh, at a think tank in DC that's focused on like good telecommunications policy and copyright policy for the internet, tech freedom, thanks to a Google fellowship. Um, and Jerry Brito, who is the executive director of Coin Center uh, to this day, is founding Coin Center. It's sort of just, just a notional conversation at this point between folks like Jerry, who've been in the policy debate in DC for a while on new technologies. He's with the technology policy program at Mercatus Center. Uh, and he says, hey, I'm starting a, a Bitcoin think tank to educate people about Bitcoin. I see you just graduated from law school. Do you want to be the director of research? Which at the time is sort of a crazy thing to probably ask somebody, but I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. <laughs> and so I, I just feel like I was very lucky because I knew I didn't want to end up at a big law firm. I knew I didn't want to be defending uh, patent trolls or uh, giant entertainment companies who want to sue people for like posting YouTube videos of their uh, artists' songs where their kids are dancing to them and things like that. Uh, all the all the terrible lawsuits that that were in the earlier wave of um, the interface of policy and and the emergence of the internet. And Bitcoin ended up being the next sort of wave of really hard policy debates that impact our our rights uh, to privacy and speech on the internet with respect to regulation. Um, you know, it's funny, if, I, if I'd been more prescient in law school, I would have taken um, more classes in tax and securities law and, um, and administrative procedure. Uh, as it was, I was really focused on copyright and I was focused on um, constitutional law. Constitutional law maybe has come in handy in the long run, but uh, you sort of like trial by fire, learning on the job about these new categories of law that I, I, I didn't have a focus on before, just as, as this technology inevitably touched almost every part of the U.S. regulatory regime, you know, whether it's in tax, whether it's in securities. And I, I feel lucky to have, um, to have been found by Jerry um, because Coin Center, I think, is it's the best job I could ever ask for. We don't have to stand up there and... and um, 
and represent any corporation in the space. We can sort of set our own agenda based on our mission, which is to defend the freedom to innovate um, and be sort of a neutral speaker for the technology as a whole rather than any one project in the space. Um, and it's just been an incredible privilege to have that have that job and 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 then to crazy things that I wouldn't have guessed coming out of uh, law school, like being invited to testify in Congress and things like that. Being being next to Nouriel Rabini, also an NYU uh, alumni, uh, and sort of actually arguing on the other side because he thinks it's all shit coins, as he actually said in his testimony. <laughs> well, it's a shame you weren't born just a little bit earlier because you might have held a chapter in Stephen Levy's book, Crypto, uh, which describes the crypto wars and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the fact story, which is very important for um, us as a society to understand as we are perhaps reliving a little bit of yeah. what the original crypto wars were all about, where the cypherpunks actually uh, emerged victorious and saved end-to-end -end encryption yep. for, um, for usage for societal good. And I'd love to pivot to constitutional rights since you mentioned that. And I can see that Peter, this is something that, that really drives you. Um, and you released a report called Electronic Cash, Decentralized Exchange, and the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And in that report, you discuss the relationship between these technologies and constitutional rights. How do you see the current legal landscape for electronic cash and decentralized exchanges? And what changes would you like to see in order to protect constitutional rights? Sure. Yeah. So... Um, I'll just first, uh, for your listeners, um, the term electronic cash is the term we sort of, after a fair amount of agonizing and debating, settled on. Um, because what the report is meant to deal with is not generally all, all crypto and how constitutional law intersects with all crypto, but specifically two things that we see emerging. One is decentralized exchange, which is fairly straightforward uh, and probably doesn't need more elaboration in this notion that we, we don't always need a Coinbase in the middle to move from one crypto to another and maybe even from some sort of fiat currency to crypto. And so what will be the regulatory implications of that? Right now, we think of these intermediaries as the choke points through which regulatory policy can still um, find purchase, whether it's anti-money laundering policy or investor protection policy. What happens when that intermediary also goes away? And so we've seen the emergence of all kinds of like auto, uh, automated market making contracts and um, and other decentralized exchange protocols. How does that change the policy conversation in DC, where we can no longer stand up and say, hey, there, there still are plenty of intermediaries. What if there are fewer? And then the other thing is this electronic cash aspect, which is the thing that I think probably warrants a little bit more elaboration because we're not necessarily talking about Bitcoin in that conversation. We're talking about the emergence of new cryptocurrencies or new layers on top of Bitcoin or Ethereum that enable people to have cash-like financial transactions and like, truly cash-like tra financial transactions. The Bitcoin white paper said Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, but if you go to, I think it's chapter seven um, in the white paper, I could be wrong about that, it's a section on privacy. The title is privacy. And Satoshi, whoever he, she, or they were, um, you know, was dead on, said, look, there's a new kind of model here wherein everyone's got pseudonyms and that affords some level of privacy, but there's no privacy for the transaction graph itself. Like we can always see which pseudonym is paying which pseudonym. And if address reuse, this is almost a quote of the white paper itself, becomes common, there could be deleterious effects for person's privacy because you could sort of cluster all the transactions that they made using the same addresses or addresses that were paying tra transactions to themselves and get a full and comprehensive picture of all of their financial transactions on the network. And so, you know, that is an aspect of Bitcoin, of course, that is not like a cash transaction. A cash transaction, if, you know, you and I were to meet um, maybe you say like, great job on that podcast. I want to pay you for that. <laughs> this is an uncompensated podcast though. I <laughs> here's, here's uh, $20. Uh, that leaves no record. That transaction is ephemeral. It involves b effectively bearer instruments, um, um, cash. And, you know, cash has been villainized. Uh, people say, oh, it's inefficient. It's dirty. 
I think what all hundred dollar bills have a certain amount of cocaine on them. Is that the thing that people say? Um, but it's also an important technology. It's important in a number of ways. It's important because it's available to anybody. Anybody can, if you have hands, you know, you can accept and give cash. You don't need to prove your worth to a chartered financial institution in order to be able to participate in an economic transaction. It's important just from a privacy standpoint, too. Um, the Bank Secrecy Act, which is the statutory law in the U.S. that creates our financial surveillance apparatus, the anti-money laundering, know-your-customer regime, uh, you know, it, it became law in the 1970s. I think it's 71. I could be wrong about that. And back in the 1970s, the amount of information that the big banks and the government were collecting on ordinary Americans was actually pretty small. Because back then, your day-to-day -day activities, like if you went to a bookstore, maybe a, a leftist bookstore where you, you know, bought some, you know, treatises on anarchy, or maybe a gay bookstore, uh, which we have actually some legendary ones here in D.C., that transaction would have been cash in the 1970s and 80s. Like, bar none. Absolutely. Um, you would have maybe had an electronic transaction or a transaction that would have been swept up into the surveillance apparatus of the Bank Secrecy Act for big things, like maybe a mortgage on your house or you buy a boat or something. But that would be the limit of it. And to me, that, that's at least a defensible and reasonable regime where your ordinary day-to-day -day activities aren't fully searchable and tracked. Um, so we, we don't have this fear of like the government developing a full picture of your every activity and all your intimate associations and therefore being able to put you on a list of like questionable based on our current idea of what's right and what's wrong in the country. But you do have some surveillance apparatus in place for the really high risk transactions where large amounts of money are moving and you could have abuse. You could have like the proceeds of crimes being laundered into real estate or something like that. That is not the regime we live in today. The regime we live in today is one where because of changes in the law and because of changes in technology, like smartphones mostly, but also credit cards, almost every transaction I make will be fully documented by my bank or financial institution. And that information will be aggregated. You can learn a lot because of clustering methods and other big data tools. You can effectively learn everything I do, all of my intimate associations. And there's no opt-out, really, except cash. Cash is still the opt-out, which brings me back to my original point. Why is cash villainized? It shouldn't be. It should be celebrated as a necessary tool to, to preserve our privacy and our, our, our autonomy. Without cash, we are at the whim of the corporations that you know, create electronic payment systems and whether they want us to transact at a given moment or not and ultimately at the whim of the government, which will collect information and also maybe lean on those corporations to block people who are doing unpopular things or politically questionable things from being able to participate in the economy. The extreme example of this is, of course, China, where they don't have constitutional rights necessarily like we do here in the U.S. to sort of defend their privacy and their autonomy. And the government is very interested in creating top-down electronic payment systems that fully surveil and control the population. The ECNY, C Central Bank Digital Currency Project in China. But before that, also the two major quasi-state-owned or really state-owned um, you know, payment solutions, uh, Alibaba and WeChat. You know, they, that information just is incredibly valuable to a tyrannical regime. And it is used by a tyrannical regime to rank and control their population. So to me, electronic cash is should be celebrated. Uh, the emergence of electronic cash, like truly private digital payment systems like Zcash, Monero, um, the layers on top of Bitcoin and Ethereum that I speak of earlier, Wasabi Wallet, um, uh, Tornado Cash. And I'm not here to come stand. I, I'm a board member of the Zcash Foundation, but I'm still not here to come up and say that one of these is is ready for prime time. It's the absolute best system for doing these transactions. All I'm saying is the people who are working on creating these technologies are really important to the future of our liberty and our freedom and privacy. And so that is that is what makes me get up in the morning. That's what makes me write like a 60-page paper on the constitutional implications um, and the regulatory implications there. Because 
even for a long time, the discussion in D.C. has been, oh, well, we're not too worried about the anti-money laundering problems because the Bitcoin blockchain is transparent. And actually, uh, as a say, someone working at the FBI, I prefer doing my investigations on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain than calling and um, sending subpoenas to like 50 different or maybe 15 different uh, international correspondent banks who don't always get back to me quickly. Like, if we were to just move forward as a society and say, like, let's use a system like Bitcoin, it would be a disaster from a privacy standpoint. Um, we need these layers on top, or we need new cryptocurrencies uh, that protect people's privacy if we're going to actually do all our transactions electronically and have some scrap of, of human dignity left. Your emphasis on cash is absolutely fascinating. And I attended a privacy summit some years ago where Margaret Atwood, who wrote The Handmaid's Tale, was a keynote speaker. Yeah. And this one point she made still stays with me, and I think about it a lot. She said, if you want to create a despotic, tyrannical regime, the very best thing you can do is to eliminate cash. Yep. And I think we've heard um, some pretty powerful arguments for why cash or the ability to have financial transactions that can't be traced or aggregated is very important. And another um, sort of noted quote that stays with me and I still think about quite frequently is something you said many years ago. Um, I believe you were providing the example of the Uyghurs in China. Yeah. I'd love for our listeners to hear just a little bit about um, that example and why it is so important not to have every transaction that an individual makes aggregated, compiled, surveilled, perhaps weaponized. Yeah. So I, I, I wish I had the, the scholar's name on hand, but there's an Australian researcher who specializes in, um, in East Asian um, politics, um, and he did some research, and his conclusion was that basically if you are in Western China— and you um, stop buying alcohol and stop buying cigarettes, it will be noticed and you will be much more likely to end up in a re-education camp in Western China. And that sort of seems counterintuitive at first. It's like, well, maybe you're getting off some, you know, addictive substances. I like my alcohol very much, so I'm not judging anyone, but... <laughs> The, the question is why, and the answer, then you, you put one and one together, and it's, oh, because if you are possibly becoming more connected to your uh, Muslim faith, you might abstain from buying cigarettes or buying alcohol. And the fact of the matter is that China feels threatened in its Western provinces by a resurgence of um, Muslim identity uh, or, or Islamic faith um, because they, they are a Han you know, dynastic regime that wants to solidify control ethnically and politically and socially over the entire, uh, over the entire nation. And so it's very insidious. It's, it's, a, it's a really good example um, of how quickly seemingly, seemingly innocent, you know, payments data can be used for the wrong purposes, for exactly the wrong purposes to homogenize a population. Um, Thank you, Peter. Yeah. And Getting back to your point about aggregation of information, I think we're all starting to see an explosion in artificial intelligence and uh, the ability for technology to be used to create a profile of an individual yeah. and then to be weaponized by uh, someone who chooses to do harm. And you've expressed some concern about China's potential dominance in the artificial intelligence field and the need for even appropriate oversight in the United States. How do you see the intersection of AI and blockchain technology? What challenges or opportunities do you foresee in this area? So it's, it's funny. Um, I actually really like AI. Um, I do. Um, I've been playing with chat GPT-4 uh, as, as I do legal research. Uh, for Coin Center, uh, and it's basically like our small little nonprofit with six employees can finally have basically like four junior associates. <laughs> and what makes that possible is large language models, right? And so 
what I can do with GPT-4 is I can create a, you know, a well-structured prompt asking for a memo on a particular complicated legal area. And it will come back to me with well-cited research on, on a large corpus of case law that it has access to on the internet. And actually pretty decent conclusions. There's a danger. Sometimes it makes up cases. It hallucinates. Yeah. And so you have to check it. But I've heard folks who've spent time at big law firms and have, you know, junior associates say that it hallucinates about as much as a junior associate hallucinates. So, you know, <laughs> anyway, I, I, I say all this to, to just offer some framing. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a, you know, I'm not one of these people who thinks we need to nuke data centers because the emerging threat from AI is incredibly profound or something like that. I think it's actually a great tool. It's a great tool, though, because it democratizes, it truly democratizes access to information. And so there's an interesting um, tie-in here with blockchains. Right now, I think a lot of people still think that if they use Bitcoin um, and you know they make transactions that end up fully unencrypted on the Bitcoin blockchain, they still have a reasonable level of privacy, right? They're like, yeah, there's a handful of entities, the U.S. government, a few others who can afford elliptic or chain analysis, the blockchain analytics software tools that allow for clustering analysis and the revelation of your full transaction graph, your full economic history on the network. GBT4 uh, combined with a blockchain effectively gives every person the ability to instantly learn all kinds of things about every transaction because it 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 is an interface that that makes it much easier for someone of more normal technical sophistication to gain access to um big sets of data because if you think about it, that's what's going on in the legal research context you know i don't need to have 50 specialists in a room reading through case law the LLM has already read through all that case law and can give me conclusions, even with fairly naive questions as the starting point of my research. The same is true for a blockchain. And so I think it was Josh Swihart uh, who posted a tweet. He's with the Electronic Coin Company that I thought was great. It was just a, a, a GPT-4 prompt. Um, tell me the name and physical address of this Bitcoin address. And that, that, that technology is not exactly here, but it's going to be here. You can, the writing is on the wall. You will not be able to hide even from your neighbor, even if your neighbor's like just an ordinary Joe, you will not be hide, able to hide from your neighbor through, um, um, through merely assuming that there's a big enough data set that somebody won't be able to have the time or inclination to comb through it because it'll take them no time to comb through it. And so, you know, I, I think what's really going to happen, the biggest first thing that's going to happen from... AI combined with blockchain is we're going to realize how bad uh, security by obscurity is. This assumption that like, oh, well, yeah, I've got some Bitcoin transactions out there, but you know, who's going to spend time to find them? It's going to take, take a while. It takes no time. And it especially takes no time if you, if you combine um, large language models with public blockchains. So effectively, it's going to finally help everyone understand in a very um, uh, visceral way how little privacy you have when you're doing electronic transactions, either on public blockchains or using the traditional financial system and, and its electronic payment tools, which also will be easily subject to big data analysis that, that anyone with an uh, open source software model on, on, uh, and access to a, uh, you know, some GPU compute online can, can achieve. Thank you. And just for full disclosure, Josh Swihart, his SVP of growth, Product Strategy and Regulatory Affairs for Electric Coin Company. Yeah. And both Paul and I are on his team. Oh. So yeah. um, <laughs> for mentioning um, that tweet, I actually found it to be inspiring uh, seeing that tweet. And it caused me to write an article about the combination of AI and blockchain forensics. And I'm wondering, let's push Josh Swihart's tweet a little further. Mm -hmm. How pernicious can it get? Can someone say, okay, I see Jane Smith owns an NFT of a rabbit with a black hat and green sunglasses and maybe a gold earring. Oh, that has a Ethereum address. Chat GPT-4 or whatever AI program yeah. I'm putting this into. Please tell me Jane Smith's address, as Josh Spivart pointed out. But I'd also like to know who are her children? 
Where do her children go to school? What medications has her older daughter purchased? When and why and how often? And on and on and on. Do you fear that the ability to aggregate such information and then weaponize it um, is right around the corner? Yeah, probably. You know, and there's been an interesting discussions about this in the sort of more abstract philosophical context. Um, Posner, I can't think of this, the elder, the younger Posner, uh, legal scholar and, and uh, behavioral economist, <laughs> used to talk about how privacy is like the enemy of efficiency. Like, maybe we should be able to learn everything and anything about everyone else all the time so we could have a more open society and more effectively allocate scarce resources. <laughs> right? And and I think some people actually feel this way. We're, we're finally going to be at this point where people who subscribe to the old adage, um, it's okay if you if you have nothing to hide, you don't need you don't you don't need privacy. And I think that's just wrong. It's sort of fundamentally wrong in, in one very obvious way, which is that um, even if you don't think you have secrets, you have, you know, personal associations. Privacy is a, is a public good. It's a shared good. The, 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 the things that you keep confidential for your friends and your family and they keep confidential for you is this large distributed public good. And if it erodes, everyone ends up having things that they would rather an insurance company not know about them or would rather would rather a, a, a personal enemy who would want to tweet horrible things about them not know about them and not for the wrong reasons just because like we all have intimate associations that can be twisted and 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 misused to abuse us and so yeah i i think we're we're going to very quickly learn the consequences of having the sort of bad data security that almost all of us now have not by choice but because the systems that we've been able to use thus far have all been very leaky and we we will very quickly realize the need for much more robust systems either for communications or for financial infrastructure and those systems are going to be end-to-end -end encrypted and they're going to have robust self-sovereign digital identity hopefully as well so that we can actually own and control and selectively disclose our information to the right people uh, and make sure that we're not just like assuming that you know, a nasty person won't have the uh, inclination or the wherewithal to pick up the crumbs of our past associations and use them against us because it'll be so easy for them to pick up the crumbs of our past associations and use them against us that actually somebody will. Yeah. And when I earlier mentioned Steve Levy's book, Crypto, just for the larger audience, crypto does not refer to cryptocurrency in that title. Yeah. It refers to cryptography. And cryptography offers up a solution for preventing some of the leakage that you were describing through zero knowledge technology. And there are a number of um, protocols and projects working on zero knowledge technology solutions to address issues such as identity mm -hmm. and encrypted digital cash. Would you like to speak about that for a bit and the importance of advancing uh, cryptographic techniques in order to accomplish these important societal goals. Yeah, I mean, so I'm not a cryptographer. Um, I, uh, <laughs> you, you mentioned I have a, um, a, a BS in econ from George Mason, and when I was leaving grad school, I was like, do I want to go get a PhD um, or do I want to go to law school? And I ultimately made the choice of like, well, I'll do whichever one I get a higher score on the test for. So I ended up getting a higher score on the LSATs. And I, sometimes I regret that choice. I'm like, well, I could have done computer science and econ or something like that. Would have been cool. But this is where I am, right? So speaking from my background, um, I think these systems are incredibly important. I don't know who's building the right system yet, which is why I'm happy to sort of represent at Coin Center generally the freedom to innovate. Um, and I do think that's, to me, the most important is... We need to make sure that the important scientific research and technological development to build these tools happens here in the U.S. And the people who are building them are not wrongly victimized when those tools get used for bad purposes. Because tools are just tools. Um, um, you know, people will use software for privacy to simply maintain their own dignity, their sort of 
freedom of speech. They, you know, they don't want their early drafts leaked out there because it squanders their their um, sense of safety when when coming up with new ideas. Um, people will also use encryption tools to hide their bad behavior, right? And so, like, tools are just tools. We can't get into the business of deciding who can use tools and who can't because that's sort of the end of a free and open society. And so that's why I feel really lucky to be at Coin Centers because that's the, basically the focus of our mission now. So as I said, we, when we started, we were doing mostly your sort of education, uh, some policy research and advocacy. We sort of have a new three things though that is more what we're doing. And I you, imagine litigation is one of those three. Well, litigation is one of those three. Actually, maybe all three of those things because the three things I was going to mention are speech, assembly, and privacy. And another way to think of that is two parts of the First Amendment and one part of the Fourth. You know, it's you have a right to publish software that is speech. You have a right to form peer to peer networks online that is assembly. You have a right to make donations to nonprofits like Coin Center uh, that you believe in the mission of or nonprofits that are, uh, you know, working to ensure access to abortions or nonprofits that are working to ensure you know, that you can, you know, still have um, the right to own a firearm. I, I bring up two things that are incredibly hot button, abortion and gun and, and, and gun rights, not because I want to polarize this discussion. And I, I, I try to be very careful here because this isn't about, you know, one of these hard issues or the other. It's about a second order issue. It's about should we be able to use um, the law and the infrastructure around us to restrict human choice, or should we just use the law? Like, we can have a policy debate in this country about abortion, we can have a policy debate in this country about gun control, but the minute you start using Uber and ride-sharing services to identify and limit people's ability to drive to a, a, a uh, a family planning clinic, that's not a policy discussion anymore. That's that's not um, enacting your policy choices through law. That's enacting your policy choices by effectively restricting the built environment and the, and the infrastructure we exist in. And so, you know, like, these are really fundamental questions and they shouldn't be left to the sort of arbitrary decision-making of the corporations that... Um, mediate our our activities as we move through the world, they should be left to government and to the individual. And so to me, this is sort of fundamental that we need to work towards having better privacy, uh, better tools for privacy and, and, and for speech. And we need to make sure that we don't stymie that development by having unconstitutional restrictions. Well, let's talk about the fight a little bit. And you've brought the fight to policymakers and regulators with congressional testimony. Um, you write uh, very um, well-received and well-regarded pieces on constitutional rights. Um, but it's one thing to speak about these rights. It's another to protect those rights in a forum such as a federal court. And I'd love to get into some of the lawsuits that Coin Center has brought. Mm -hmm. um, I will recognize you're an attorney. I'm an attorney. My co-host, Paul Brigner, who heads up U.S. policy for Electric Coin Company, is an attorney. Um, so I apologize that we have uh, a number of attorneys uh, on this podcast discussing um, legal subjects and lawsuits, but I think it's important. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about the lawsuit that you and Coin Center are involved with um, against OFAC in the Tornado Cash um, litigation. Could you provide some background on the case, why you believe it's important to defend the right to use privacy tools in the context of cryptocurrency? And I think it'll be helpful for our audience to um, really understand the, the background of why this litigation was important. Yeah. Um, and I should point out that I'm actually not an attorney. I went to law school, was trained as a lawyer, but I work in public policy. Good enough for me. And, you know, it's 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 worth pointing out because in this case, in the Tornado Cash case, we're not um, attorneys, we're the plaintiff. And the reason for that is because Coin Center, as a nonprofit, 
has accepted um, donations in the past that have been through Tornado Cash so that the donor can maintain anonymity as against the general public. So Coin Center is a 501c4. We um, advocate for our mission. We are very much a political association, if you will. And, you know, when folks want to support um, a particular political cause, they have certain rights to membership organizations, to make contributions. And one of their rights, which is established in NAACP versus Alabama, is that the list of everybody who's ever donated to an organization isn't something that the government can reasonably expect to go get from the organization. And, you know, this makes sense in the civil rights uh, movement of the, uh, of the 60s and 70s, because obviously Alabama didn't want a list of the NAACP's members uh, for the right reasons. It wanted it basically to victimize people who were standing up for civil liberties. And so the Supreme Court said, look, we, we can't have state laws that ask for a list of all the donors to political associations. We simply can't. Um, because speech needs to be facilitated by association and membership organizations. And so um, when OFAC sanctioned Tornado Cash, um, they sanctioned a series of smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. They added them to the SDN list, which is the list of foreign nationals or their properties that Americans aren't allowed to pay or transact with. Um, we should probably define for our audience what OFAC means. Right. So OFAC is a division of Treasury. It's the Office of Foreign Asset Control, which is the part of Treasury that specializes in enforcing sanctions. Um, and so OFAC um, identifies these Ethereum smart contracts and says these smart contracts were involved in laundering um, money from the Lazarus Group in North Korea, um, allegedly in North Korea, a hacking group that is involved in a lot of ransomware attacks. OFAC says, look, we in the past have sanctioned um, cryptocurrency mixers, custodial mixers. We've sanctioned Bitcoin addresses, and we're just doing that again. That's all we're doing here. And the fact of the matter is what they're doing here is actually quite different. So in past cases where they've sanctioned custodial mixers, they've sanctioned persons who actually have control and custody of funds that are being mixed. They have discretion. They have a business when they've sanctioned Bitcoin addresses in the past, they're sanctioning Iranian nationals who have the private keys to any Bitcoin sent to those addresses. So these are, to us, um, fairly routine and reasonable uses of the sanctioning powers in the context of cryptocurrency. Why is Tornado Cash different? Tornado Cash is different because 21 smart contracts involved in using Tornado Cash um, are immutable. There are smart contracts that once written to the Ethereum blockchain, are outside of anyone's control. They're effectively like a, an extension of that decentralized protocol itself. And so they're really just tools out in the world that are available for Americans to use or for anyone to use. And so when, um, when folks have wanted to donate to Coin Center in the past, some have chosen to use Tornado Cash to disassociate their perhaps known Ethereum addresses from the payment to Coin Center's address. And so in a very real way, um, Coin Center as an association that collects donations in order to do its advocacy work is affected by these sanctions because we are now limited in our ability to have donors have their privacy when they donate to Coin Center. We also joined with other co-plaintiffs um, one of our co-plaintiffs is in Florida and they do a lot of uh, software development work on top of Ethereum and they've traditionally historically been paid on Ethereum. And so this is somebody who's, whose usage of the Tornado Cash smart contracts from their employer to them is simply to maintain privacy against the general public with respect to their, their monthly paycheck. Perfectly reasonable. This isn't about hiding money from the IRS. They pay their taxes. They reveal their income to the IRS. They just don't want to reveal their income to their neighbor, right? Perfectly reasonable. And we have another co-plaintiff who um, is anonymous. They're uh, John Doe in the suit because it'll be fairly clear why. They have facilitated donations from uh, Americans to support the war effort, the defense of Ukraine. Uh and the reason why you would want privacy uh, if you were facilitating those kinds of donations on Ethereum 
And the reason you would use Tornado Cash is because if um, you were to just make um, public transactions on the Ethereum blockchain, the Russian Secret Service, the Russian um, intelligence uh, apparatus will identify you and you will become an, uh, a target of, a, of cyber attacks, basically. So another very legitimate pro-democracy, I would argue, usage of the Tornado Cash smart contracts by an American. And then we've also got a co-plaintiff who um, is a, a well-known podcaster, actually, <laughs> who, because they are very public uh, with their Ethereum address, they got dusted. And this is a, this is an interesting thing. Even after the sanctions, the Tornado Cash smart contracts are still there. They're still operating. This is very different than sanctioning uh, a bank that relies on, say, correspondent banking rails um, for throughput. The Ethereum blockchain is going to keep running. That's that's the purpose of the networks is to be censorship resistant and permissionless and open and free. And so even after the sanctions, you could still send money to the Tornado Cash smart contracts. I wouldn't recommend it as an American because you'd be violating sanctions laws, which carries really strict civil and criminal penalties. But a foreigner can freely use these contracts. And somebody, we don't really know who, sent a fair amount of money through the Tornado Cash smart contracts. And then sort of it went in tiny amounts to all kinds of known people in the space. Shaquille O'Neal actually got dusted with some Tornado Cash money after the sanctions. Um, uh, it was uh, Jimmy Fallon got dusted with some Tornado Cash money. And our co-plaintiff uh, at the Bankless podcast also got dusted. And so why would we uh, have them as a co-plaintiff? Why, why are they interested in challenging the law? Because if you get dusted, um, you are now obligated to do... Um, uh, you are now obligated to do reporting, P potentially into perpetuity, because you've received sanctioned property according to uh, uh, according to OFAC's interpretation of their statutory authority. And are there penalties for not reporting? Yes, there are very severe penalties for not reporting. So all of us have suffered an injury because of the sanctions, but none of us, it should be obvious from the way I've described all the code plaintiffs, are actually doing anything where we're paying a foreign person or paying a sanctioned person. None of us are making payments to North Korea. None of us are involved with anything to do with terrorism. These are all very legitimate domestic uses of a software tool for maintaining personal privacy. So let's talk about constitutional rights in that yeah. regard. In Crypto Wars 1.0, where the cypherpunks emerged victorious, Software as speech was a rallying cry. Mm -hmm. Is that yet another rallying cry here in the Tornado Cash uh, scenario? Or are there differences, you think, between how software and speech were connected in the original crypto wars? So there's a lot to unpack there. Mm -hmm. Our lawsuit has a First Amendment component because of this associational privacy claim, which is the government can't... Um, prevent organizations like Coin Center from maintaining some level of donor privacy. And so there is a First Amendment claim within our lawsuit. But the main claims in our lawsuit are statutory authority. We're arguing that the underlying statutory th statutory authority that OFAC is relying on, the IEPA or the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, um, it empowers the executive to do very specific things, to identify foreign persons or entities and their property, and then add them to a sanctioned list, the SDN list, and forbid Americans from transacting with those properties or those persons. And so our, our narrow claim, but a very important claim, is that the 21 smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain that are immutable, that Coin Center might use to receive donations, that our software developer uh, in Florida might use to receive their paycheck, that the person facilitating donations to the Ukrainian defense might use to maintain privacy while, while engaging in that expressive activity. Uh, those uses of the smart contract don't involve foreign nationals, don't involve foreign entities or persons, and they also don't involve the property of a foreign entity or person because those smart contracts are not in the control of any identified sanctioned person. It's not as if North Korea owns and controls that tool. They've simply used that tool. And w allegedly, we don't dispute that, but that doesn't actually seem material here. 
The fact that North Korea uses Phillips head screwdrivers, which I assume they probably do, does not mean that Americans should no longer be able to use Phillips head screwdrivers. There's no property interest for a sanctioned person in the, the tool itself if it's a tool on a blockchain and it's immutable and not under the control of any person. And so this is a this is a fairly narrow statutory argument. Um, we're not going down the road where we're saying because the Tornado Cash smart contracts are code, there's some sort of absolute right for that code to always exist or be freely shared or things like that. There is another argument to be made, but it's an argument to be made, I would say, by the developers of Tornado Cash to the extent they're interested in making that argument, that if they were to become the target of any kind of adverse government action, they have done nothing for which they can be forced to prior to have prior registration or other things. Um, but that that's not something in play right now. The government's not coming and saying, hey, you can't publish Tornado Cash smart code, smart contracts or, or software. In fact, um, GitHub, the Microsoft owned software repository that actually hosted the Tornado Cash protocol so it could be sort of researched and discussed rather than the version of it on the Ethereum blockchain, took down the protocol. But that's a business decision by Microsoft. And so query what the First Amendment implications of that are because of the state action uh, aspect of First Amendment claims. You know, First Amendment claims can be brought against prior restraint by government. You don't necessarily have a right to have your tweets go out without Elon Musk censoring them right? because Twitter is a private company. So GitHub's a private company. And what's interesting is GitHub ultimately did restore um, that software repository. So it didn't end up staying down. And this happened after OFAC offered some clarification that by sanctioning these smart contracts, they're not saying you can't publish or republish the code at those smart contracts. They're specifically saying Americans aren't allowed to use that software, which is different than a typical first a typical First Amendment claim in the in the days of the crypt, the first crypto wars was you've developed PGP, you've developed RSA uh, encryption algorithms um, just for encrypting messages and things like that. You literally can't publish that research about strong encryption in a book or to the internet or even on a T-shirt because that is a munition. It's a it's a weapon because it's violation of the Export Control Act. Ver violation of the Export Control Act. So we're in a slightly different legal territory here, but there are still very important questions at play. There are statutory law questions in our case and the First Amendment associational privacy claim. Um, but there isn't at this point a claim about actual prior restraint of the publication of protected speech. There could be in the future. So fast forward to the future. Let's assume <laughs> for the moment that... Oh, tell, uh, t t tell, me, tell me which stocks to buy. <laughs> well... I think you could just ask uh, Auto GPT now. Yeah, you're right. And you know, just say by any means necessary, and <laughs> you won't get into any trouble, Peter. So let's fast forward to the future at a point in time when let's assume Coin Center is successful in its lawsuit against OFAC. What would that say then about how Coin Center was able to promote privacy, free speech, and decentralization? So. If we win, uh, I think it'll be a very important decision. From a just a strict, narrow, you know, what grounds would we win on? Uh, assuming we win on a statutory interpretation claim, we have created a hard stop as to how how far OFAC can use its statutory authority with discretion to effectively ban Americans from using certain tools, and that's that's important for crypto. For the obvious reason that that if the Tornado Cash smart contracts can be added to this SDN list and Americans can be banned from using them, I don't see how you could distinguish that from them also being able to add the Bitcoin protocol writ large to the SDN list um, or the Ethereum protocol writ large or the Zcash protocol writ large. Um, so it obviously matters from a crypto standpoint. It also just matters from a, a good interpretation of the rule of law standpoint for all technologies um, because... IEPA and the sanctions powers are not intended to be a tool by which the executive can simply pick and choose which technologies Americans are allowed to use. It's, it's a much more specific tool. And, and 
it's much more justifiable based on its specificity than on some broader interpretation. It's intended by Congress to be a tool to identify actual foreign nationals, like, say, the gentleman in Iran who was using Bitcoin addresses to collect ransomware payments, or the Lazarus Group itself, and say, Americans shouldn't pay that person, or Americans shouldn't buy that person's property in a way that enriches that person. That's reasonable. Um, you know, we can have a larger debate about whether sanctions policy is a good way to do, you know, uh, geopolitical policy globally. I'm, I'm not here for that debate. I'm just saying that that is actually a reasonable usage of the statutory authority offered by Congress. It is not a reasonable usage of that statutory authority to say that you can identify persons, you can also identify products, services, and just code itself on decentralized blockchains and say Americans are no longer allowed to transact with that, and no longer allowed to use that. Because at, at that point, you get effectively a sort of heckler's veto, which is kind of interesting. You get this idea where um, if, you know, if North Korea wanted to do a lot of damage to American competitiveness, and this was the way OFAC worked, what could North Korea do? They could just use all kinds of tools and technologies, and by using them, make them questionable, and then OFAC puts those tools and technologies on the OFAC, uh, uh, on the sanctions list, on the SDN list, and then Americans aren't allowed to use them anymore. It effectively, would impoverish Americans from using the very best tools simply because some bad person overseas has used them. So, like, if, if Treasury or OFAC's current interpretation of their statutory authority is allowed to stand, it gives them this sort of unbridled authority to just tell Americans what technologies and tools they are and are not allowed to use. And that ultimately becomes a sort of ability for foreign regimes to basically tell Americans what tools they are and are not allowed to use simply by using them. In deciding what technologies should be used or not used, isn't that a bit of a backwards narrative? Because in some sense, it's a government deciding to judge and then punish a technology for how it might be misused and completely ignoring the upside or the positive societal benefits to technology. We live in a world where technology, and we've talked about this briefly with artificial intelligence, is advancing rapidly. And there are positives and negatives and very um, complicated extrapolations that one can do to determine whether this technology might be misused or not. But to block a technology or prevent its use by citizens, to me, that feels like an attack on the constitutional rights of United States citizens. And yeah, I'd love to hear just a little bit more about other than in the tornado cash lawsuit that Coin Center is bringing against OFAC, what opportunities are there to educate policymakers and regulators about the proper lens in viewing these new disruptive, powerful technologies that um, in the next five, 10 years will be even more um, impressive in terms of what they can do? I mean, I think an obvious thing to highlight is just a, a matter of international competitiveness. Um, the discussion we had earlier, some might say it was hyperbolic about AI. Um, I don't think so, though. I've been wrong about like I've been wrong about predicting the future of technology, and I think like everyone's ultimately wrong about predicting the future of technology because these things they're innovations because no one thought about them before, right? But I, I think it's 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 already obvious that AI is going to do a lot to change the information landscape in a way that makes like strong encryption and privacy and personal agency harder to achieve. Um, and so we need a sort of arms race on the defensive side of technology. You can think of this in a sort of more general sense that like AI is this offensive technology that allows you to more rapidly and with more ease learn a whole lot about somebody, right? And so what's the defensive technology that we would want to, you know, oppose that force? It would be strong encryption it would be um, verifiable data structures like blockchains and peer-to-peer -peer networks where you don't have to assume trust in some sort of root authority. So 
in a world where the the first thing to always bring up in a policy discussion is we can't uninvent these things. They're not going to disappear. And so in a world where AI is not going to disappear and where crypto is not going to disappear, we want them in balance, right? And I think, you know, I think right now, especially in the wake of the failure of some really like big companies in this space who are doing incredibly irresponsible things. And honestly, some of them just seem like scam artists. Um, the reputational damage that's done to crypto is really dangerous. Because I think if you go to Congress and you say, take a meeting with somebody, uh, a staffer, or, or maybe a, a member who's interested in these topics, you bring up AI, they're like, yeah, it's powerful. It's important. You bring up crypto, and then they'll say, eh, it's just a bunch of bubbles and scams and the people who get the best benefit out of it are criminals, right? And and that's, I think, a, a, a dangerous perspective because I think they're both extremely powerful technologies and they need to be, in some degree, in balance. You, you need to harden and make more robust your cybersecurity, whether it's through encryption or through ultimately through verifiable data structures like blockchains, if you expect to be able to resist the sort of onslaught of information gathering that AI allows, you know, foreign intelligence agencies to to utilize, or even just you know individuals to utilize, um, it's embarrassing the state of data protection and cybersecurity in this country. Like you look at the OPM hack, you look at the Target hack, you look at just a guy, there's a there's too many to mention as far as like leaks of sensitive consumer or government employee data um, because of poor cybersecurity. And the problem is we don't have like I'm listening to myself talk right now. And the problem is we don't have silver bullets yet, right? Like our space has been bad about focusing on sort of the more internet casino aspects of crypto and been slow to market with real information security products that are based on the robust peer-to-peer -peer permissionless blockchains that that can deliver, I, I do sincerely believe, can deliver real improvements in cybersecurity. But right now we've got this very bad image problem and for reasons that are mostly self-inflicted, where, as I said, someone in Congress is going to look at this and they're going to say, uh, the AI is scary but also powerful. The crypto stuff is mostly scams and money laundering. Like, that's a real problem because these two things are you know, important to each other. When we're talking about zero knowledge proofs and shielded transactions and encrypted digital cash, such that individuals can transact without surveillance or um, hackers obtaining their information and yep. then using that information against them. We need to perhaps think about how encrypted technology can actually harden national security efforts. Government employees tend to use Signal when they want to communicate with each other yeah. um, and not have those communications pierced. There's a value proposition there. They can even use Apple Messenger, which is end-to-end -end encrypted, to have those private communications. When we think about building blockchain technology to allow for a similar end-to-end -end encrypted interaction, aren't we making the efforts of North Korea and pariah nation states and uh, organized crime more difficult because they're not able to intercept that data and then use it for their ill-gotten gains? And in also focusing on a decentralized world where information is not stored in a government server that can be hacked and then used by North Korea or some other pariah nation state, aren't we also advancing the interests of our citizens here in the United States? How do we take that message of the very, very positive benefits of end-to-end -end encrypted technology to our policymakers and regulators and educate them in a way that they recognize that in this 
transformative world of AI and data aggregation and hacking and malware, we need to take action now. Otherwise, it's going to be too late. It's, it's hard, though, um, because what's the action, right? Um, when, you, when you go and you take a meeting in Congress, it's usually not a good idea to come in there and just tell them a bunch of things and not not have a specific ask, right? Um, the specific ask in some cases is just don't just don't close the door to innovation in this space um, because of um, overreaction to some of the bad that we've seen, the internet casino aspect of it, the Ponzi schemes and the scammers. Um, you know, I'm not generally in the business of, of going out in there and saying that my government should start using this technology. Uh, I think it, it's premature, probably. Like, it would have been probably wrong to go, you know, the Clinton administration was the first administration to have a, a web page, right? Probably would have been wrong to go to an earlier administration and say, hey, you should have a web page, you know? Um, and it would have been wrong to say, hey, we can get rid of the federal registry uh, 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 for rulemaking and everything can just be online in 1995 when most Americans aren't online. So like, it's not a good system for notice and comment uh, to the public. And so, I, I, you know, one thing is we can, we can explain the promise of the technology, but I think policymakers are kind of tired of hearing that because they've heard that for a long time and they want to see results. And hell, I want to see results. So there's shortcomings to that until there are people with projects in the space that are actually about like robust self-sovereign digital identity and selective disclosure of identity attributes that say, yeah, the OPM could, you know, contract wholesale or use an open source software library to do better at securing government employee data, fingerprints and things like that. But that, pro that tool is not necessarily like obvious on the shelf, just waiting for government to buy it right now. And then the other thing, so, you know, we need those tools. We need industry to actually build them or researchers to, to build them and they need to be battle tested. And then we'll have a better argument uh, as to why this technology is worth preserving. Short of that, we have sort of the vague descriptions, but also the sort of like nature of America, right? And that's why at Coin Center, at least we, we do keep coming back to sort of constitutional law argument that there's a reason we have a First Amendment. Uh, it's not just something that happened to get written in our founding documents for no reason. It's that there was this perception that the best answer to bad speech, whether it's tyranny of a foreign government or bad ideas domestically, is not censoring speech, is not getting rid of it. It's more speech. It's a marketplace for ideas. And the thing that makes America so different than North Korea is that everyone's allowed to express an opinion, you know, about their leaders, about science, about the arts. You don't need to get it approved before you go online and share your thoughts. And the reason why we have, you know, at least some safety with regard to our own, you know, domestic policing is because a law, someone in law enforcement should have to go before a judge before um, they can search a person's home and prove to that judge who's a you know another check on the otherwise unbridled authority of investigators that there is reasonable suspicion of a crime and and so you know what we're doing now at coin center is is less going to policymakers and saying hey look this technology is great it can solve all your identity and cybersecurity issues today because that kind of overpromising is dangerous um it's more, hey, look, this technology is actually enabling some people to protect their privacy. This technology is allowing some people to actually transact um, without censorship. We need to make sure that as we apply the laws to these early uses of this technology, we do so in a way that works with the Constitution. So if somebody wants to donate to Coin Center anonymously, using privacy protecting tools like Tornado Cash or Zcash, they're not stopped because stopping them would actually be a restriction on their First Amendment associational rights. And that's not American. 
And yeah, you might want to pass laws that allow government to step in and stop all those transactions, but that is that's that's the North Korean approach. That's the tyrannical approach that says, you know, we've had it with the marketplace for ideas. Yeah, you keep saying there'll be good ideas that offset bad ideas. We just see too many bad ideas. So let's get rid of the First Amendment. And the same with the warrant requirement. Um, there is a bill that um, Senators Warren and Marshall introduced um, that would classify everybody effectively in the cryptocurrency ecosystem, whether they're a custodial exchange like Coinbase, who is already a money transmitter and already has BSA compliance, or the developer of a software wallet who just makes software so people can hold their own money, or a miner on these networks or a staker on these networks or a node on these networks who classify all of these entities as Bank Secrecy Act obligated uh, financial institutions and would argue that all of these people need to know their customer, do anti-money laundering compliance, register with FinCEN, and report suspicious activities. Irrespective of whether this person is, as a software developer, actually operating any kind of financial institution and actually in control of anybody's money. This is just massive overreach because at this point, our, well, at this point we're not dealing with um, a bank or a, a third party where people willingly give up their privacy to use that third party service. And then the government can, under the third party doctrine carve out of the Fourth Amendment, go to that third party and say, hey, give us information about Peter without a warrant. That's, that, that's the current regime. But this isn't even that. This is because Peter used this software, we can go to the software developer and force them to get information about Peter. That's, that's crazy because it, it just sort of let's just, it says that like the warrant requirement is effectively meaningless. Because if you use Microsoft Windows, you'll no longer have privacy, you know, the, the protections of a warrant. Um, we're already pretty far down this road of the warrant requirement being fairly meaningless in the U.S. In the sense that if you use a hosted email provider like Gmail, there's some very real questions about whether you have um, the protections of a warrant for searches of your, of your email or at least the metadata associated with your email, let alone cloud storage and other things. But what if you lost your warrant? Um, protections, even in the context of using just some open source software. That's insane. Like, there has to be a limit to this. Do you think we will see the resolution of this at the United States Supreme Court, or will a federal district court um, decide this in a way that the industry can move forward? Well, it depends on the, it depends on the specific issue. So, um, the Warren Marshall Bill is not law. Um, I'm hoping we can present reasonable arguments as to why it's not workable and in extreme overreach and it never becomes law. Um, in general, for something like our tornado cash lawsuit, uh, you know, I think no matter what, it gets appealed, right? Um, and so I, I do think these things likely go all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has these important questions about, you know, what is the reach of the administrative state? Um, what does the First Amendment really say about software? Because it's interesting that the Crypto Wars version one, if you will, um, they won um, they won some cases in the Ninth Circuit um, having to do with software as speech. It never went up to the Supreme Court, and there's some some there's a bit of a circuit split, like Corley in the Second Circuit, which is about um, copyright violations facilitated by software, um, like uh, the removal of DRM and things like that. They said, well, uh, you know, if it's just a tool for breaking the law, like removing DRM, is it still speech? There's there's interesting... Now, to, the, to lawyers listening to the podcast, you might say, well, well, Corley's a special case because copyright, uh, while to some extent a restriction on speech, has always been viewed by the court as also a promotion of speech, because if people can get the economic returns from their copyrights, they'll be incentivized to speak more. So Corley is a special case because it's about copyright. But anyway, all of this is just to say that like that, even that question hasn't roundly made its way up the Supreme Court, and I think it's going to have to. Um, There's some other cases that have made it up to the Supreme Court that make me optimistic that the current court's perception of, you know, what is protected speech 
is actually extraordinarily broad. So there's IMS Health versus Sorrel, which is a case where a number of, uh, there's three states in New England, uh, Vermont, I think New, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts, if I'm not wrong, uh, put laws in place to ban the sale and resale of prescriber identifying information. Uh, what that means is prescriber identifying information is like which doctors prescribe which drugs. And there are data brokers who collect all this information so that pharmaceutical companies can then send marketers to doctor's offices to say, hey, why are you prescribing Zoloft a lot, but not prescribing our you know, competitor product? This is like, you want to talk about a very clear case of commercial speech where this isn't in the, the speech in question, the, the thing you're not allowed to buy and sell anymore isn't, um, you know, like petitions to the White House. It's literally which doctors prescribe which medications. This is very squarely commercial speech. And the Supreme Court in IMSL versus Soros said states are not allowed to ban the sale and resale of that prescriber identification information. And one of the things that the states argued is, well, it's not really speech because it's commercial speech. And the court said, no, we, we're going to have similar standards for commercial speech and regular speech. We're not going to go down that road. And the other thing that the states argued is, well, it's not really speech because it's just information about um, prescription activities, to which the Supreme Court said information, facts about the world, is sort of the fundamental root of what is speech and what is meant to be protected by the First Amendment. And so, you know, that case, which is, I think, under discussed, so I'm glad I bring it on a podcast that um, maybe more constitutional minded lawyers and, and scholars might listen to, that case is really kind of fundamentally important because at the end of the day, what is a cryptocurrency uh, protocol? It's facts about the world. It's, you know, if, if you perform these mathematical operations on these underlying data, SHA-256 or whatever, you're going to get this output hash at some rate of predictability. And we can use that to do things like create, you know, times for blocks and a, a fair leader election for a consensus mechanism. So like at a very real level, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Zcash, Tornado Cash, the smart contracts themselves that made that system work are just facts about the world. And so banning the publication of those things in a very fundamental way bans progress in the science and arts, you know, and technology. So I think we've got good ground to stand on, but yeah. This is probably going to be one of those things over the next 5, 10, 15 years that goes all the way up to the Supreme Court and will have some very highly publicized um, and very important rulings on hard questions. So it's a very important and comprehensive fight um, to preserve this technology, to preserve privacy, freedom, to really free speech. To, to, to preserve like what it is to be America. Yes. I mean, and this is a country that's had all kinds of problems. God knows like like inequity and Jim Crow and like there's a lot of things that are not worth saving about America. This one core notion though that you should be able to speak your mind and you should be free from, you know, government um surveillance without some sort of judicial protection like a warrant. Like these are the things that separate us from the rest of the world. I mean, even even from Europe in a, in a fundamental way. Like lots of people have been saying in crypto, like, oh, well, we'll just go to, we'll go to the European Union because the securities laws are being so broadly enforced in the US, they've become hostile to innovation. I think at some point there's going to be a, an interesting reckoning. The European Union does not have the robust tradition of protecting speech and is at least as concerned uh, as America is with respect to anti-money laundering policy and how how comprehensive that can be. They're in, even developing their own new anti-money laundering authority. That's right. And th th that's an interesting process in itself, the move from doing it uh, from the member state directive level to actually an EU reg centralized at the EU commission. I don't know who are the people making that decision. I also don't understand uh, <laughs> the, the, the actual procedural structure of European Union governance. And so I, I, I this is why Coin Center mostly focuses on U.S. policy. Um, I think you put your finger on it, though, because yeah. this regulation, the AMLR, mm -hmm. the R stands for regulation, yes. and as opposed to a directive, which there's a yes. bit more flexibility for the member states to 
govern as they see fit within certain constraints. A regulation, on the other hand, is right. a bit more prescriptive. Yeah. Um, so that that does summarize it quite and well. At, and at the end of the day, um, if that regulation is drafted broadly to say you're not allowed to publish software for a decentralized exchange, for example, unless that software is published to include a mechanism by which an identity token is generated or collected by the protocol and information about who's trading on the protocol is reported to the financial uh, surveillance authorities. That's compelled speech. Um, but in the EU, I don't think you're going to have the robust um, First Amendment jurisprudence. Well, it's not going to be First Amendment jurisprudence. I don't think you're going to be able to reach the UN Declaration of Human Rights and say, yeah, we have free speech here too. They can't compel us to author software in this way. I think it's much harder to argue there easier and, and and at least possible to argue here in the US. And and that is very important. And I think we got on this topic, you were asking like, like, what are we trying to save here? And we're, we're trying to save this kind of wild notion of what is America, which is that we're willing to accept a fair amount of um, individual freedom, because this is a country that has a lot of optimism and faith in its citizens that they'll use that freedom wisely and they'll use that freedom to do really cool things. And in large part, we, we often do. Like the, the internet was mostly born in this country because of those freedoms, because you could run a data center here that was relaying a lot of speech information and you, you felt like, well, at least I'll, I'll be able to argue in court if they ever come for me that this is all First Amendment protected. Good luck doing that in Brazil. There's lots of good things about Brazil. I don't mean to you know, be mean to Brazil, but in Brazil, truth is not a defense to a defamation claim. So if you say something's nasty about a politician, even if they're true, you can be, you, you can be fined for that, you know, like anyway. What I'd love to land on perhaps even wrapping up the podcast today is on the subject of central bank digital currencies. Hmm. We've talked a little bit about the fight that you and Coin Center uh, are engaged in, in order to preserve and protect these fundamental rights. And yet governments, for whatever um, antagonistic position they may have vis-a-vis -vis, uh, cryptocurrency, blockchain technology, they've landed on a solution. Their solution globally um, is to create a central bank digital currency whereby the nation itself would be the purveyor of a particular um, mm -hmm. digital transaction, hold the keys, centralize the information, and then potentially have the ability to surveil. Yep. That's a pejorative, but no, I, um, I, it's honest. But honest. And I'd love to get your thoughts about how do you reconcile, on the one hand, government saying, this technology is concerning and we need to over-regulate it. Mm -hmm. And yet, oh, by the way, maybe we should own it. So it's an interesting. I have very um, complicated feelings about CBDCs. And so I'm going to try and be uh, thorough and careful in my answer. What you are suggesting, um, which is that cynically, but probably accurately, some regimes are interested in outlawing private electronic cash, things like Bitcoin or Zcash, things like that, and replacing it with a digital dollar that they have full visibility into is a very accurate portrayal of exactly what's going on in China. We had the Bitcoin mining ban. We've had, I believe, I'm not a Chinese policy expert, but I believe they've actually just outlawed people from owning and holding it themselves directly. We've had, you know, irrespective of the specifics, a lot of hostility towards, you know, private digital currencies. Um, private is in, you know, non-government and private is in private as well, is what was something like Zcash. And simultaneously, we've seen them unveil this ECNY product, which according to its technical specifications, it's very interesting. It cuts the Chinese banks out of the information loop. Um, so right now you have the situation where the larger banks and the larger payment processors like Alibaba with Alipay or WeChat, they of course have full visibility into what the users of their payment applications or their depositors are doing. 
and they report all that information, of course, to the Communist Party of China because they're good party members. ECNY would actually eliminate those private uh, or those like um, quasi-market participants. It's always hard to sort of articulate in the Chinese context because they're all partially state-owned. Would eliminate those parties and the raw data of what all the users of ECNY are doing, all their day-to-day -day transactions, all their intimate associations, goes straight to the monetary authority, to the issuer of ECNY. It bypasses that private private sector. And so this is sort of a very naked grab at direct visibility for a small number of people within the government for all of the transactions of all the citizens of the country. You might say, like, what are they even going to be able to do with those mountains of data? Well, they'll use AI, you know, <laughs> they'll they'll have a chat bot that'll say, like, please tell me what Peter Van Valkenburg is buying. And coming back to our exactly. earlier conversation. So they'll actually be able to wield that immense power um, to achieve greater control over their population. I would in no way defend the CNY CBDC project. That said, I have another line of thinking about digital money that's obviously very transparent and why I'm in this space. I think money and payment systems are public good. I think the fact that we've ended up in a world where cash is often looked on as, you know, unfavored, we won't accept it here, it's dirty, it's just for criminals. And in some places, it's just disappearing altogether. Like in Scandinavia, there are people who've grown up and don't even know what their national currency looks like because they never use it. They use a payment card or an app. That puts us in this position where all of your interactions with the economic system are intermediated through corporations. And, you know, in an ideal world, these are highly competitive corporations and we rely on market forces to make sure that none of them become exploitative and, um, you know, uh, antagonistic to the interests of the people who rely on the systems they've built for their livelihood. How competitive are banks? They have to get government charters to operate. They're creatures of the state, actually, in a very real sense, from a, from a legal standpoint. Um, and how competitive are banks in a world where they keep failing and getting bought by larger banks, right? And we end up with only two or three of them. In that world, I have a big problem with the way electronic payments look, you know, setting cryptocurrencies aside for a second, because that's a fully privatized, um, corporate run surveillance state effectively with all of the same potential insidious outcomes as you could imagine from my description of China with ECNY before. So query how much worse it is for all of your payments to have to go through JP Morgan than all of your payments to have to go through ECNY. They're both going to end up at the central government of the, of the country. And you're going to hope for rule of law protections in that case, but they may or may not be there. More likely to not be there in China than in the US, but we shouldn't be too optimistic about the long-term health of, of our uh, um, reverence for the rule of law in this country either. And so in a world where I do think that we should have public goods for payments, there is, it's a wild possibility and probably one that's extremely unlikely. But there are some folks who think that we could direct the federal government to issue a fully anonymous bearer instrument digital dollar. Perhaps using zero knowledge technology. Yes. And, and you know, it's important to delineate what parts it would have control over, but then build those control systems into the technology. We're not going to remove from the U.S. government the authority to control the monetary supply. So it's not going to look like Bitcoin where there's only 21 million ever issued. So they would have full control on the protocol to create and destroy, to issue and redeem. Probably not negative interest rates. That's kind of hard to do because then you might be stealing money out of people's actual individual wallets, but maybe even do that. I don't know. That That's more on the, we're getting maybe too nuanced in the discussion here. The thing they should not have control over is any ability to actually see what happens to that digital bearer instrument after it leaves their issuance. And these can be built, as you said, with zero knowledge proof um, based blockchains, things like Zcash, things like Tornado Cash. Um, 
And I think it would be, you know, it would embody American values because it would be a return to electronic cash. It would be still dollars, though. And so good for U.S. hegemony and geopolitical interests uh, and national security because dollar, dollar dominance and dollar dependence are really central to that. Um, and it could also be private and protect American civil liberties um, for, for individuals and actually export those civil liberties abroad, right? Because the minute that there is a <clears throat> as good as dollars digital bearer instrument, that's going to be the dominant like payment mechanism around the entire world. Who's not going to want to use that? I don't think anyone actually wants to use ECNY because why would I want to use ECNY? Why would I willingly sub subject myself to CCP surveillance? But if using this meant that I had technological assurances that I would have privacy and I'd have all the benefits of dealing in dollars, that'd be pretty good. Uh, politically, it's I don't know if it's viable, though, because it's an end run around the banks, just like in China. It's an end run around the banks and the banks are powerful interests in U.S. politics. Like, who's going to want a dollar um, deposit account? Uh, unless the interest rates are really high, maybe, uh, where you could just hold digital dollars, in a, you know, directly. So there's all kinds of things that make this probably something that's never going to happen. But I just wanted to point out that my feelings about CBDC are kind of complicated because I, I do not like the world that we've ended up with where we have full corporate control over the electronic payments infrastructure. This is why I like cryptocurrencies, because I see it as sort of a mutualist bottom-up alternative. Um, but obviously, if, this, if the CBDC is issued just as a way to gain more direct surveillance and control over the population, like China's CBDC, it's a terrible idea. What a wonderful, complicated, and maybe even controversial place to land. So thank you, Peter. This has been a tremendous uh, podcast. Paul and I are thrilled that we were able to have you on the PGP Pretty Good Policy for Crypto podcast. I have to say in coming back uh, to the point about attorneys, uh, your legal expertise is bar none. Um, and I have to thank you personally for your leading voice um, and your fight and your hard work in the ongoing conversation about cryptocurrency policy and its influence on innovation and individual liberties. Thank you, Peter. What Thanks. a pleasure. Thanks, Gary. It's been a pleasure.